name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, we come before you this evening with expectation. We have struggles, we have concerns, we're tired. We anticipate, Lord, your visitation. We ask, Lord, that you would overlook our shortcomings. Allow us, Lord, to have our heart prepared to receive your visitation. Lord, speak to us through your scriptures. Allow the words of St. Paul to resonate in our ears, in our souls. Lord, help us with our personal struggles, with the crosses that each of us uniquely shares and knows to be our own. Be with, Lord, our extended family and friends and those who struggle. We pray especially for the sick amongst us, those who are not here because of illness. We pray, Lord, for those that are being tempted, those who, whose faith perhaps is, is compromised, those who are confused, those who are disenchanted, who find themselves removed from the loving acceptance of others. Lord, we ask that they would experience you and find their way back to you. Help us, Lord, to be the conduit that would bring others back to you, the bridge that would connect others to you. We ask this in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <coughs> well, we're back. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm always happy to see you. Um, I want to thank you so much for being so sacrificial with your time uh, to come and, and to do what you're doing here. And perhaps... You, not many people say thank you to you, but I want you to know that I thank you for your care and concern for your salvation, care for for learning about the most important, you know, things of life, which is knowledge that can impact us for salvation. And, you know, the church calls this wisdom in contrast to worldly knowledge. And, and wisdom is discerned in the spirit, and it's superior to human knowledge. Not that we neglect human knowledge or feel like it's, it has no value. It has its place. But yet we have to defer to the revealed wisdom of the life-giving Holy Trinity, which guides us, in the words of the liturgy, into all truth. Into all truth. And so this evening we come with expectation. I'm glad that you're here. As always, be patient with me. I have my own my own idiosyncrasies as we all do and we have fun here we talk our, we kind of get into our personal lives a little bit here and you get to experience the distortedness of your teacher which is good because I'm not perfect and, uh, and then as always I always profess that I have not cornered the market on the Holy Spirit and I'm not free from error but I think that together as the collective church we can pretty much march pretty carefully and and with um, the confirming witnesses of, of many in, in find our, our path here. We begin our study with chapter 2, verse 27, and we're, we're, we're progressing, you know, we're, we're moving. We're slow, but, you know, we're finding our way, you know, you know. It's like, you know, the blind man with a stick. It takes a little longer to get to where he needs to go, but he really appreciates it once he gets there. So, okay, verse 27, we hear the following. For indeed... He was sick also almost unto death. Now, once again, we're referring to Epaphroditus, okay, who was one of those uh, co-ministers with Paul, remember? He, uh, from last time, he he was ordained a bishop by Paul, and eventually he was assigned to the, to the Philippian church, you know, to lead it and guide it, but he went through many struggles. For indeed, he was sick also almost unto death but God had mercy on him and not only on him but on me also lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow now what kind of illness did Epaphroditus have what kind of illness did he have he had do we know not really <laughs> It's not a trick question. You know, it would just probably fill up the mind now. How is he going to trip us? You know, well, you know, we really don't know. But what do we know about his illness? What do we know about it? Serious one. Grave. It was grave. It was serious. Mm -hmm. It was, it was you know, potentially mortal. And, um, you know, so it's, it's really kind of interesting to, just to see his commitment and his devotion. You know, the fact that, that 
that he would be bothered to the point where he would neglect himself, you know, for his sheep. Now, um, so we know it had the potential to be terrible. So to whom does St. Paul assign Epaphroditus' healing? Who does he assign it to here in this verse, verse 27? What does he say? God. Yeah, okay, so he says, For indeed he was sick almost, almost to death, but God had mercy on him. Okay? St. Paul was very quick to identify the source of his healing as God. Now, remind be mindful, you know, they, they didn't have Urgent Care or Chandler Regional or Scottsdale Memorial or Barrels, you know, on every corner, you know, of Jerusalem Heights or wherever they were at in Philippi, <laughs> Asia Minor. You know, they didn't have, you know, they didn't have access to the things that we have to, today. You know, they had their, you know, their very you know, primitive concoctions of, of herbal remedies and and the Greeks had some methodology, they did some primitive surgery, you know. But, you know, the medical science was nowhere advanced to address the challenges of major health issues. And so, truly, health was a very special commodity. And any type of illness, you know, would put one in a precarious, you know, life threatening, you know, dangerous situation. And so, <coughs> Uh, this certainly was the case with Epaphroditus, but St. Paul is very clear to see the hand of God upon his healing. Okay? That God uh, had great mercy upon him. <laughs> do you think Christians were more apt to seek God's help at that time? What do you think? David yes. says, yes. David confirmed he nods yes, of course. You know, of course they did. And, and, and uh, you know, because, you know, of the absence of medical science and that was so far behind. In fact, sometimes I think it's to our detriment today that, you know, we're so quick to run to the doctor. And I think, you know, sometimes we just, we don't even think of God when it comes to our health. I mean, do you see that today? You know, people are more apt to, well, you know, I mean, you know, if we, if we have, uh, if we have an upset stomach, we run to urgent care, you know. You know, if we have a sore throat, oh, you know, we go to the emergency, you know, you know, <laughs> and you know, we know what's happening in emergency rooms in our city. So that, that becomes the medical office of first, a first choice for, for many people because of, of course, health care issues yeah. and who's going to pay for what. And that's always going to be the, you know, the determinant, I guess, is, is uh, you know, is how we pay for this. Okay, so, um, so prior generations did not have at their disposal the medical advancements the medicines, you know, the technology to treat the ill like we do today. Um, what do you imagine the life expectancy of, of the people were at the time of Christ? What do you think it was? I know we've kind of broached this topic before, but what do you think? 30, 35. Okay, perhaps, you know. You know, we know for sure many women didn't make it through, uh, you know, uh, you know, after childbearing years childbearing, and, and yeah. menopause, it was very, it was very, many died in, in childbirth. Mm -hmm. So it was a very, so the life expectancy of women was was even less than men. And, uh, but you know, it wasn't uncommon for people to die in their 40s. It wasn't uncommon. And, and for men older, perhaps a little bit. And so, you know, life wasn't just taken for granted. It wasn't a given that you were going to make it to, to 60, 70, you know, or, or older. It just wasn't the case. So my question is, should we then um, <coughs> avoid seeing a doctor and availing ourselves to modern medicine? Is that a taboo? Should we should we not avail ourselves to doctors? No. no. Okay. No. no. Okay. And uh, so... But but what but you know there are heretical groups that do this, okay? Can you think of a heretical group that that tells their followers not to go to the doctor? Yeah, the Jehovah. Oh, Jehovah Witness yeah. Wells. Jehovah, yeah. Actually, it's a Christian scientist. Oh. Mm -hmm. The Christian scientist, okay? And and because the and how do they rationalize this? What is their belief system? What do you think? Then God's gonna heal them. All they've got to do is pray. Okay. Yeah, but, but what's their, f their fundamental belief about the body? It's not good. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a delusion, too. 
that it's really the, the problems of the body really aren't real. Mm. And so, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll go away if we just focus on the spirit. You know, they're not really there. Yeah. And so this is kind of implied in the theology of the Christian scientist movement. And, and of course, it's come to our attention when we see these major, you know, legal cases where, you know, where, you know, Mr. and Mrs. are not allowing their, their teenage daughter to have a medicinal procedure, a surgical procedure that would extend her life yeah. because they're against the use or the implementation of modern medicine to impart health. And of course, that's a tragedy. And the church, you know, laments that. So, uh, how do we know? <coughs> where do we find credence for seeking of modern medical help and seeing, seeking the help of the pharmacist? Where do we see um, the positive aspect? Where is it? Where is it revealed in the scripture? What do you think? Saint Luke. Huh? Saint Luke. He's a doctor. Saint Luke. Okay, Saint Luke's a doctor. Okay. Where else? What do you think? Christ healed. Okay. Okay. That's a little bit later, but yeah, but in the scriptures. Christ healed. Okay. Christ healed. Okay. Mm -hmm. But but I'm like modern medicine. Oh. Okay. It actually comes, you know, uh, wisdom of Sirach. Okay. It talks about it in the intertestamental books. Sirach. Okay. He says, you know, blessed are the hands of the of the surgeon and the physician, for God has uh, given them. The knowledge to affect healing, and he says the same thing about the pharmacist that he has taught them how to use the potions, you know, of, of herbs and such, to relieve the ailing and the suffering of men. Okay, Sirach. Sirach, what is this? Yeah. It's a, it's one of the books of the Old Testament that we have. Yeah. See, we get acquainted with our scripture when we come to the Bible study. You know? So there's like 18 intertestamental, intertestamental books called the Deuterocanonical books. The Sirach is one of them. Okay. In fact, I should I should get the exact quotation for you. Father, you know how to spell it? Sirach, uh, capital S I A I I R A C H. Okay, so, you know, so the church is not opposed to medical. You know, um, improvement. You know, because we believe that God blesses. You know, the physician and such. And so, so we don't kind of, you know, exclude ourselves from these things. In fact, many if you go to the monastery, St. Andy's, a number of the monks have had medical and surgical procedures. Oh yeah. Or at least in here he's had knee replacements, yeah, and, and he's going to have a shoulder repaired soon, and and uh, well, you know. They go to the eye doctor, they go to the other doctors, they go to, you know, neurologists, and they go to surgeons, you know, so th they know that it's blessed, and, you know, and so, so we acknowledge the blessing of, of, modern, of modern medicine and science. Now, what is the Holy Church's um, attitude... Uh, let me think for some rice and state this. You know, do you know that um, in the canon law book of the church, there's a canon that, pro that pro prohibits us from going to a Jewish doctor? Did you know that? No. Okay. Huh? Okay. Okay. Yeah, there is. Now, does this apply today? No. No, now the key thing is, um, so it, it, this wouldn't preclude us from going to to a doctor who is Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim, would it? No. Uh, because they're all, I mean, they're all on a loop, okay? Okay, yeah. You're, yeah, I mean, yeah, you go to yeah, most of them. Are, yeah. <laughs> most of them are Hindu, and, you know. So you know, you're really out of. Of luck today, because you know ninety percent of your, you know, practitioners are probably fall into these categories. But the key thing is, is uh, I believe not. The uh, the Hippocratic oath requires that all modern doctors treat all people with the utmost of integrity. Okay, that is the oath that they have to take. They have to do this. So further, uh, as I said, some of the best doctors in the various fields today are are non-Christian. If uh, if God can speak through a donkey, 
in the Old Testament. He can certainly heal us through a physician who doesn't have illumination. Okay. And so that's just something. Now, does a does a practicing Orthodox Christian doctor have an edge over other doctors? Yes. Okay. Um, explain. It's service. Okay. The work that it's a ble it's blessed and okay. so the he's that doctor is using his gifts and talents for the Lord. Okay. So uh, he's a so he he's allowed himself to become a tool of the Holy Trinity. And uh, in fact we have an example of Saint Luke the uh, the new who was a a surgeon in the uh, um, in in, 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 in yeah. Just yeah, and there he is. And he he was uh, he was a physician first, a surgeon, and then he be, he decided after his wife died that he would become a priest, and they made him bishop very quickly. And he refused to do surgeries unless he was able to bring in his icon of Theotokos, you know, and, and the saints, you know, to to be with him. In fact, the communists used to complain because the, you know they were atheists, and he said, you know, I'm not going to do the surgery unless I can bring it in. And of course. You know, they wanted his talent, so they allowed him to bring these things in. So they quick, quickly allowed him to do his thing because they realized, you know, that this was a man who was a pioneer of, of modern, much of modern anesthesia and medical and surgical tools. He, he basically was the pioneer that they did a lot of them, at least in Russia and, and, and uh, later in Siberia. So, Father, I would definitely bring mm -hmm. him in mm -hmm. if you have surgery. Okay, yes, blessed icons, you know, you do the best, uh, she did, and Beck, her surgeon's name was what? No, his son's name was Luke. His son's name was Luke, and, and he said that his patron saint was Luke the Apostle, who was, a, was also a physician, okay? So there are many practicing, and I think that they do have an edge, providing they are practiced their faith, okay? Now, this doesn't mean that if somebody is lax and slothful in their preparation was orthodox, that God will bless them. You know, I mean, you got to be on top of your game. You got to be doing the right thing. You know, so it's not a, it's not a. Um, what's the, um, the card you get in the in the Monopoly to you pass the jail or something? You know? get out of jail. Yeah, get out of jail card. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, so oh, an orthodox doctor has an edge. How so does God responds to their prayers and assist them in their diagnosis, their treatment, and their care for the ill? So was the canon against using a Jewish doctor wrong then? Yes, it's the canon is wrong. I'm asking a question. What do you think? Okay. Now okay, was the canon against using a Jewish doctor wrong? You, you can't say canons are wrong, but it's but right. but you know, you know and the reason we really can't answer this is we do not know because we do not know the historical practice or the particular context or the situation that spawned it, that created. It. We knew that Jews were very mischievous against the early Christians in many different ways, and the canons many of these came from the fourth century, okay, where it was very common that the Jews would try to you know, to create problems and, and, and prevent the Christians from getting the help and things that they needed. And there, there was just, there was still great hatred, even at that time. And so there may have been something that, that spurned this canon and said at that time in that location, it was not wise for a Christian to see a Jewish doctor. And that might have been very well correct. But today we're called to look at our present situation and see, the canons can change from century to century depending upon the historical uh, construct that one finds himself in. So we may find ourselves in a situation where religion isn't held against a person in medical treatment, which I don't believe it is today. And so therefore, you know, the canon would not be applicable in our present age. And so the church might say something different. It may not be held against you in the society we live in, but there are societies where probably is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, bright buildings. I, I wonder I wonder what happens in, in Saudi Arabia. 
you know, if you had a, if you have a Christian surgeon, I wonder no. if they would would go to it. What would happen? I don't know. Yeah. Ninety years ago in Alabama, if the practicing mm. surgeon was African American, yeah, and the person it, laying on the bed wasn't, mm -hmm. what would have been the reaction then? Yeah, very so much so. Context. I think yeah. you, you bring up an interesting point. Context mm -hmm. is crucial to a lot of things that we discuss because mm -hmm. we can't take things literally. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There usually was a reason in that particular situation. And that's what we always have to do. And that's why, like, even reading the scriptures, if you take it out of the context of the historical church for which it was written for, then you can't interpret it correctly. Because you're trying to put together, you know, this, this beautiful tapestry without seeing the picture of what the final product is supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. And this is what St. Irenaeus said in, in the second, third century. You know, to the, uh, you know, to the, um, you know, to the apostates and those that were leaving, you know, you can't interpret this. This was written for the church. The church understanding that it fits the church, and it fits its worship and its theology. You can't try to, to make it into something that it's not. And just for us to ponder. Okay, now, uh, and these are all interesting things as you try to apply orthodoxy to, to the modern um, historical construct we find ourselves in. Okay, so if there are, if there was a particular hostile relationship between Jews and Christians in the presence of deliberate medical mistreatment from a region that promulgated the canon, I do not know. But, you know, God knows. Okay, now, is it wrong for Christians to seek treatment from, from action, from, from, uh, through acupuncture, chiropractic, and other neo-medical sciences? Is it okay? Hmm. I would think so because it's going to be related to health and and okay and, and natural pass of course you know, mm -hmm. which covers the whole category. Yeah. Okay, what do you think? Okay, Barb says it's okay. Joseph, he says, oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I never thought of it like okay. that. Okay, what do you think, Catherine? What do you think? It's fine with me. Okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll find out eventually. The peanut gallery. I guess as long as they're not like praying or doing things, you know. Okay, that's a key point. Um, you know, this, this is a key mean, point. You know, um, there. That's perhaps the one caveat. You know, um, what would that be? Like in the case of. Uh, Beware uh, the chicken of going, bones. Huh? Beware the chicken bones when they throw them out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they do some. You know, some primitive pagan, <laughs> maybe a Budo. Just don't go to the Budo doctor you know, for your healing, okay? Because now you're opening your world yeah. to the, de the world of demonology, yeah. okay? So we don't want to go there. So, um, what would be, in the case of um, acupuncture, what would be the one caveat that you say you would have, you'd want to be careful of? That they're not sticking in a doll. Okay, well, no. well, that's Budo, okay? Yeah, okay. Exactly. But for acupuncture, you know, it's it's the key thing is is that that we don't buy into the Hindu philosophy that tries to explain or interpret the healing power that occurs um, in acupuncture because of the grids and the the energy flow which they confuse for what? What do they confuse the energy? Well, huh? circulation. Well, they confuse the energy flow with what? What do they call it? The soul. The soul. That's that's their idea. Of the soul is the energy flow within the grid. That they have this whole grid that, that, that the energy flows within the body, okay? And so they confuse that. And, and what we have is we have, like, some Greek doctors that go, and, and they go to, you know, to acupuncture school and such, and they come, they come out there actually espousing Hindu philosophy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think that's incorrect. I don't think you can find, you know, first of all, the philosophy doesn't fit, you know, what's the revealed truth of the church. Now... Does acupuncture help? Yeah. 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 I wouldn't go if I needed to. How many of you been to an acupuncturist? Okay. Did, did it help? Yeah. Okay. Anybody here? Anyone else? Okay. One. Two. Okay. Did it help? Yeah. Okay. And so the church is not opposed, you know, to, and, and you know, the Chinese have studied medicine for how many centuries? How many decades? You know, or millenniums. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so there's something to it. Now, the correct interpretation of why it works is where the problem comes in. You know, we cannot accept their philosophy, the Hindu philosophy, of why it works. Because we believe that it's God working through it. 
for maybe reasons we don't even understand, you know, totally or completely. We just know it works. Just like with the with the with the herbs that we get from the rainforest in the Amazon. Yeah. We don't know particularly why they work, but they do. And if you mix them together and you increase the potency of them, they seem to work even more effectively. And so we use them because, and there doesn't seem to be any uh, okay. negative well, side effects. Of, like marijuana, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. the pain. Well, I mean, um, I mean, it's herbs. Okay, remember, everything that God created is good. Is arsenic good? Is arsenic good? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, get you to rats. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is, but arsenic is a food to a particular bird. And it's good for that bird. If you and I have arsenic, it's no good. Okay. You're going to meet Jesus quick. Okay. okay. And we don't have to do a, a dope uh, triggered uh, tent rally in, in Sedona, you know, or a sweatshop, whatever they call it, in order to have our, our Jesus meeting. What about the Indian medical chief? whatever. Well, this is the, this is taboo too because you're stepping on the area of 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 pagan uh, spiritualism, where they're they're praying you know to their you know to their um, to the great chiefs of the proceed of them and, and so we we enter into the the, the taboo area of, of, of perhaps demonology of, of fallen spirits. What if, if they give you herbs or something like this? Well, herbs I don't have an issue with. I think you know I think lots of people have, have stumbled across things that are very helpful. You know I just saw someone a couple of days ago he gave me some special special tsai from the mountains of of northern Greece that are especially effective to help people who have the crud, okay? And, you know, and so, you know, these are all practical, you know, homegrown remedies that are very helpful. And that, and that when they didn't have medicine, people used it, and they, they were able to get by. And I don't think we should discontinue them. We recognize the value in them. Something that was just mentioned, you said it might be pagan that they, uh, I don't know if food would pray is the right one. They're past chiefs. Mm. So I'm thinking, how is that different than we pray to saints? For mm. us, the saints represent something special for us. Well, The chiefs represent the linear history of their people. Well, but very, very clearly because of, of the effects it has upon the people. You know, you can see actually the, the negative aspect of their culture, their life, and how it impacts them spiritually and I've had personal relationships with Indians and I've seen the negative impact upon them of the practice and even how they'll, they'll reach this ecstatic state where they're out of body control in which the spirit actually takes over them mm -hmm. and this is clearly not the, tr the, the tradition of, of blessedness of the church of what's holy and so we can't generalize and say all roads are good that lead to the world of the spirit. That's that's a very dangerous taboo because we risk danger of entering the, and this is, actually goes back to primitive society. You know, the same thing that the witch doctor or the Indian chief experiences in Navajo Nation is similar to what the witch doctor in North Africa has experienced as a, mm -hmm. as a practitioner, as a shaman or the Hindu shaman. Same the same type of experiences. But this is not part of, of the Christian experience, where it's peaceful, the fruits are positive, there's there's no um, out of controlness. In fact, this is probably more representative of what you see in a charismatic, you know, which is a non, you know, recognized thing within orthodoxy of, of this out of controlness, you know, that's present. George, you're going to say that. Well, again, uh, we venerate the saints. And yeah. We have very strict mm -hmm. criteria that we say they're saints, okay, based on uh, their lives and also on many miracles and so forth. So we're pretty sure that when we venerate or we pray to them, we're praying to a saintly person who's in heaven who intercedes on our behalf. When you're praying to a chief, how do you know whether, you know? We don't. We There's don't. There's no way we can know. You know. And there may be a chance that they're not godly, that they may be more possessed or whatever. So you're praying to, you could be praying to a demon, you don't know. Do you? I think there's no way I could ever say I knew. Yeah, I'm just saying you don't really. know. But for that culture, mm -hmm. that function, if you will, I don't know if that's the right term, 
serves something. And in our culture, we've got our saints. All I'm saying is, well, it from serves our perspective, the, uh, it mm, might look. Mm, yeah, it serves the need of people to seek the divine. And for them, because they have not had the revealed truth, you know, that's they're looking to anything that's in the world of the spiritual, which is dangerous. And then, but yet, this is what this is what these Orthodoxy encountered in its missionary activity in in, in Alaska. And yeah. Saint Herman writes about it and how you know the chiefs had to you know to be purified, and yeah, as they were seen into the Christian faith and the things that they went through. And, and actually, the demonic activity was experienced from uh, from in the Indians, as 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 the people were being Christianized by by Herman and Tikhon and the others who would come over from Russia, the Russian missionaries. To Orthodoxy's credit, at least we didn't go overboard with what happened in the Catholic West in South America, where 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 people were were bludgeoned into submission. You know, to the point of, 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 of their lives being taken from them, you know, to submit to, to the gospel of Christ. The one thing being about Orthodox, Orthodoxy, and it's an evangel, is that it lives amongst the people. And it shows them the light of the gospel through, through, through living the faith. And that is the compelling thing that has attracted, you know, missionaries. In fact, this was a story of somebody who did missionary activity in Africa. One of the things that... Um, that prepare Orthodox to be so readily received in, in Central Africa was the fact that the missionaries did not come impose a culture or a system on them. Uh, the Orthodox came and they lived amongst them. And, and that was the only reason that they were embraced. And, and then their culture was Christianized and, and the things that were pagan were eventually, you know, became marginalized. And so the, the Orthodox was very careful about how it it entered into the mainstream of a life in a different place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how Christ is. You know, he works in increments to bring us to the fullness of truth. Continuing. Okay, so, um, so we had to be very careful about the philosophical systems that underpin various medical sciences, okay? And even chiropractic itself draws a lot from, from Hinduism. So you have to be very careful. You don't buy in, you know, to you know, into the the pagan philosophy that they try to interweave into why they're able to impact health through chiropractic or acupuncture or various potions or, or things. I think we have to be very, very careful. Continuing verse 27, for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God, but God had mercy on him. So, and one of the th things I want to say as a preface is that God's mercy is beyond measure and understanding. Mm -hmm. It really is. Mercy is one of those things that you can't put, wrap your arms completely around because it's so vast. So let's try to begin with a little study of mercy. Okay. First of all, what is mercy? Let's try to define it. What is mercy? A penny for your thoughts. Got it. Like unconditional love? Or? Okay, unconditional love. What do you think? It's also forgiveness, isn't it? Huh? Yeah, forgiveness. forgiveness, okay. What is mercy? What is mercy? Compassion. Compassion, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Can I say grace? Okay. Yeah, I guess you could. Okay. What else? You know, it's, it's vast. Mercy is vast, okay. Nice yeah. yeah, you know, and, and <clears throat> but um, I want to take you through a little study of the word, of the word, okay? The Greek word for mercy is what? Elios. Elios. And, and, and where do we hear this in the liturgy? Elios. Elios. Elios is, is, is derived from Elios, okay? So, Elios. Elios de Masoveos, okay? Have mercy upon me, O God. So, the Greek word is elios, and it, and, um, and it finds several words to describe it. Okay, pity, okay. Um, as you said, tender compassion, loving kindness, saving mercy, okay, which has mercy in it, and help rendered especially 
to, in desperate situations. So a very pronounced a help in a very pronounced needy situation. Or the word pardon, pardon, you know, which is implied of the forgiveness, okay? So pardon. So these are the words that are kind of, um, that are invoked when we, when we look at the Greek, the Elios. Now, now, mind you, mercy is not just something that, that began, you know, in, with the New Testament. It goes back to the Old Testament now, okay? So now you got to go back from the Greek to the Hebrew, okay, to get a greater and wider sense as to what mercy means. Okay, so the Hebrew words share light on the meaning of mercy. And there are two words, hesed and rakamim. Hesed and rakamim. Hesed means steadfast love. It means unwavering, you know, unchanging, solid love or covenant love. And I want you to kind of think about that remark. Covenant love. And the Jews always, you know, their words always have a sense to the community, mm -hmm. to their identity as, as, a, as a holy people. Okay. And so when we think about mercy, we have to have the same idea that we're speaking of the holy community. The holy community, which is what? What is our holy community? The church. The church. Yeah. The, the church of God. Our church. And so... In this sense, mercy can be understood as God's saving love manifested to his covenantal children, baptized Christians, i.e. the church. Okay? Saving love. Okay, now, Rakabim is derived from the Hebrew Rekam, which means a mother's womb. Yeah. Okay? So it's derived from, from, from a female's wool. <coughs> so in this sense, mercy can be understood as the loving action of God, as that of a mother or a parent responding to the sufferings of its child. Okay. Doesn't that give more light on it, on mercy? You know? You know, it gives kind of a deeper perspective. Um, a theologian, Dr. Robert Stackhouse, is, says that mercy or alios is um, God's love poured out upon his people. It's God's love that's poured out upon his people. And so the first comment that Connie made, you know, is, is, is love, is, is probably pretty correct. Okay? It's God's love poured out upon his people. Now it's interesting that the that the late Pope John Paul II said, mercy is love's second name. Okay? So mercy is love's second name. So mercy is just a little bit below love. It's, it's kind of right, right there together. Okay? And so when we, talk, when, we, when we talk about the topic of mercy, we're going to this deep maternal or, I guess, paternal love of a parent for a child. And yet this pronounced relationship because of that of that of the, that we have been engendered by God we have become the children of God through baptism yet there's this profound sense of, of heightened need for it you know that we desperately need and are starving for alios for mercy so you have this fullness of of the maternal the paternal you know our deep pronounced need and that is only satisfied when we intersect with what we call the mercy. In fact, when the, the church, the church's most perfect prayer is Kyrie eleison, mm -hmm. okay? And, and because it succinctly defines everything, you have Kyrie eleison, which is uh, Lord, okay? Lord, which refers to he who is God of the universe, okay? Okay. The despot, the ruler, mm -hmm. okay? The Kyrios, or the Hebrew, the... Uh, uh, Yahweh, which refers to the unspoken name of God that was so holy. And then me, a sinner, Lord have mercy in me, a sinner, which defines that he's the perfect God. I am the sinner. And the only thing that can create relationship between the perfect God and the sinner is what? It's mercy. Elios, mercy. Okay? It's the only thing that bridges us is mercy. So bridge, so mercy is the bridge. And it's based upon 
the love of a, of the of the loving father for the prodigal son. Okay, and so this kind of epitomizes or captures the essence of the mercy. Is is this unending, unchanging, radiating love that shines forth from a loving father towards his estranged children, who perhaps have been in covenant with him, but now perhaps are estranged because they're in the land of prodigality. And so they need to come back. And so this is all implied in uh, the mercy of, of God. Father, how does that apply to the Beatitudes where he said, blessed are the merciful? Well, <coughs> same thing, you know, and so what does blessed mean? Evloitos, which means, which is two words, ev, prefix for good, logos, words, only good words can be spoken about the merciful. Why? Because what have they what have they done? Well, they have imitated God. They have, they have imitated the God of mercy. Okay, they become imitators of God. Because when you're merciful, you imitate the God who is the God of mercy. And so, blessed and merciful, so they shall obtain mercy. Because when you are merciful, you shall obtain mercy. And that's the same thing with forgiveness. The extent you forgive, you shall be forgiven. Okay. And so, mercy is the password. Okay. It's actually the past four. <laughs> okay. So um, there's a lot in a word. There's a lot in a word. And so, you know, now that when you hear Kitty Layson, your understanding will never be the same. Oh, yeah. You know, you're going to look at, oh, my gosh. This, this Kitty Layson stuff, this is pretty serious business. <laughs> you know. And so your relationship is perfectly fine. He is the one perfect, holy God. I am the sinner. I need him, and the only way for this relationship to be realized is to plead for mercy, ask for mercy. But Father, it's begging, you know, that's, that puts us at such a diminished level. That's pride. You know, you know, it's blessed are the humble, the pure heart, for they shall see God, right? Yeah, just something you find, you know, because we really, remember the, the publican and the Pharisee? It was the yeah. publican who, who was given approval by God because he knew his true condition relative to God. Or the Pharisee was blind, so we have to be cognizant that very much ourselves too. Okay, continuing. Let's go back. A lot in one verse. For indeed he was sick, almost unto death, but God had mercy on it, and not only on him, but on me also. Now Saint Paul detected God's mercy on him as well, and that a healthy epaphroditus would ease his workload. Yeah. But he's his workload. Have you seen the same mercy of God visit you during times in which you fell overwhelmed? Oh, yes. yes. Okay. Well, that's what else. Many times, okay. What do you think, David? Okay. Okay. Anybody want to share anything? God forbid we get personal. <laughs> Learn a little bit more, huh? Where can we can start? Yeah, that, that's that's a good point. You know, I don't even know where to begin. It's such a common, you know, a common denominator throughout my life mm -hmm. that I can't begin to to even consider a time where I haven't been rescued, you know, where I haven't been assisted. And um, so there are many times in which God has sent us extra help, maybe at home with a child, okay. With child care, you know, maybe at work when you received additional help to, to finish a grueling task, or perhaps um, more time to finish a project or an assignment that has come due or is past due, you know, and so and there are so many other examples, you know, of of God kind of coming to us and assisting us, you know, especially, especially during our time to eat. Also mercy okay. for, pardon? Also mercy for um, years for repentance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he gives to people more years to repent. Mm -hmm. This is through his mercy. Yeah, yeah long life, you know. Uh, and I tell you, some people I see in nursing homes, you know, you know, they need the time, you know. <laughs> and I see how they treat the staff and they're cranky and... And the old guy waves his cane, and, 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 and you know, and you know, 
<laughs> sometimes, you know, long life is, is, is especially helpful because it may be the only thing that will get us in the, in, in the pearly gates. You know, we need, we need time to get our act together. We need to, we need to kind of go through things, unfortunately. You know, it's just everybody has a different script as to what we need in order to come to our senses. And say, God, yes, I need you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, my life is a tragedy. You know, but you know, in those cases where help has not come via another time, via another person, perhaps we have witnessed God sending us additional strength to finish things. Okay, maybe there was nobody that was available to help you. So God gave you an extra um, boost. I don't want to call it. Of, uh, what's that uh, soft drink called? Bolt. Mm -hmm. Okay, where you get your 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 triple dose of a shot of, of caffeine, you know, to kind of get you through your afternoon workload. And um, you know, I think that we get this increased grace and energy in order to accomplish things when there isn't the availability of someone else. So God finds a way to. Uh, to always get, but but when does this usually occur? When does this usually occur when God gives you the strength? When you ask Him. First. Yeah. When you're at the very bottom. Of yes. The when you're at your wit's end. When you say, I, I, I can't take you, another moment. I you can't know? do anything else. Will uh, you please help? Yes. Me? Okay. And that's usually when it happens. Because God wants you to give up and surrender. You know, God, I can't do anything without you. You know, and usually we're, we always try to do it ourselves. God doesn't need, need to be bothered. You know, I can do this myself. I'm, I'm effective, and and then, you know, and then we get, you know, we get grumpy, we get mean, and you know, we get tired, and and then we get resentful, and then we then we start saying bad words, and then we we have bad thoughts about people, and lots of people, others who could have been here that aren't, you know, you know, and we begin to go down this this very dark path, you know, where. Where you know, we become very unlikable people, you know, very far from the image of God, and that's not what God wants. He wants us to, you know, to constantly seek His help and intervention all the time. It's not a, it's not a cop out, you know. We're designed to, to constantly be in communion with Him and to seek His help and all. This is the, and this is the secret of the saints. They were not afraid to ask at every moment. And this was Saint Herman's, uh, you know, prescription. You know, call upon at all times from this moment. From the second, you know, always call upon him. He was just totally relying on God. And that's why he was able to do the many things that he did and to made a profound fact upon the, the Aleuts, the Eskimos, the Tinglets, you know, the indigenous Indians of Alaska. You know, profound influence. Pomery. Okay. <clears throat> lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. This is the words of all. You know, the Godson of Elsa, lest he should have sorrow upon sorrow. What type of sorrow was St. Paul referring to here? Sorrow on top of sorrow. For the death of uh, Eve was happened. Okay. Okay. It was. Okay, so what kind of sorrow was it? It says sorrow upon sorrow. Uh -huh. Deep sorrow. And so what is another word that sometimes serves when we talk about deep sorrow? Depression. Huh? Depression. Depression? What's that, another D word? Despair, despair, despair. Mm -hmm. you know. Now, I don't think Paul would have experienced despair because he had seen too much, you know, but he was using a figure of language, I think, mm -hmm. to say that, you know, despair upon, I mean, you know, uh, sorrow upon sorrow. But, um, so I want to talk a little bit about despair. Um, why is despair lethal? Why is it lethal? What do you think? You can get so down deep in it that you can't see your way out no matter okay. what. Okay, you, you, you see no possibility of getting out. What else? Why is it lethal? It excludes God. Okay, because mm -hmm. it excludes God. Mm -hmm. It says, in fact, what does it think of God? At that he point? doesn't exist. Okay. He, he, he isn't. You know, when you're in a state of despair, you just you negate God altogether. Mm -hmm. You just say, just he isn't, you know. And unfortunately, you know, yeah, and, and people reach that state in, in struggles. And in fact, this, this is what concerns spiritual fathers almost more than anything else, is when, when someone reaches near the point of despair. Wow. Because they totally give up what? Hope. Hope, hope, hope. hope faith, 
believe. All these things are just, you know, just thrown off the edge of the table. They no longer matter anymore. So, the, um, so it's a state of total hopelessness. In, so how does despair compromise one's relationship with God? I just want us to underscore this here. How does it compromise our relationship with God? Gary? How does it compromise our relationship with God? Despair? How does it affect it? We don't trust him. Okay. 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 So, so basically, it, it's a set state. There is no faith in God's help. It is the total absence of faith or belief. Mm -hmm. Total absence of faith or belief. So my question now becomes, how do you, how do we help someone in this state? How do we help? What do we do? Pray for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Deep prayer. Deep prayer. I mean, you get on your hands and knees and you pray hard. Not just say, oh God, um, so and so is going through despair. Okay, please help. Uh, no, go refrigerator and get your, your biscuit. You know, you know, you know, move on with, you know. You know, you gotta, you gotta put some, you gotta put some up into your prayer, okay? You can't be just, okay, somebody asked me to pray for them. Uh, help, John, uh, next. You know, you know, you know. You know, I mean, sometimes I, you know, as a priest, I can be guilty of it too. You know, I, you know, sometimes I get. You know, the worst place for, place for a priest to go to the hospital because then everybody, the, you know, oh, stop, go here, go here, room this one, go, you know, and, you know. Pray for me. For pre right. After a while, you want to hide your collar. And, you, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> confessions of a priest. That, that could be a bestseller, huh? Confessions <laughs> of a priest. You know, okay. okay, so, you know, we we have to be cognizant. We, we have to have deep prayer for them. And what else? What else should we do? What else can we do? Encourage them. Encourage, okay. Or, or help yeah. them with their yeah. supposedly impossible task. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I'm not going to see myself out of this financial crisis. We'll sit down with them and start one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do your taxes. Let's do this. Let's talk to your creditors. Mm -hmm. You know, and pretty soon, all of a sudden, you see a little path, a glimmer of light. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes you've got to do that. You've got to get them through the initial steps. Because sometimes it's just because of the clutter and the confusion in their personal life. They don't know where to start. Sometimes it's all we have to do is get them to the starting line. You know, and that might, that might be enough to lift this whole spirit of despair where, where all of a sudden they have hope now. And they can see the possibility of something positive occurring. And, you know, sometimes, um, you know, we need to bring to their attention, you know, um, that there are other people that are in worse circumstances who are sustained by what? Faith. Faith. Yeah. Look. Look at so-and-so. You know, you know, they're not, you know, roll, they're not rolling over and playing dead. You know, and they have much more, you know, that's working against them than you yeah. do. And so... But I'll tell you, sometimes the most important thing is for what? Just listen. Listen. And what else? Compassion. Hmm? Compassion. 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 Simply your calming, encouraging presence might be enough to swing the scales in the favor of God. You know, yeah, everything else is my, but look, I'm here. I'm still your friend. I haven't abandoned you, you know. I still see p potential and possibility. You know, you might be here this night because you have to tell that friend these very things. You know, mm. we're not here. Be we're not here by accident. God has a script mm. for each of you, as He does for me. Mm -hmm. And there are things that you gleam from what is said and, and discussed here mm -hmm. that will have direct implication upon your next day. And all of you have shared with me experiences. Well, most of you have. So. You know, and so, believe me, you bring a lot more to the table than you can, than you, it can be quantified. You bring God in you. Remember, you, we are Christophori. We are God, we are Christ bearers. Yes. Christ is born in us. When you come and you receive, you open your mouth, you receive the Soma Ke Christu, Christo, yeah. you're receiving the actual presence 
the uncreated energies of the living God, the grace of God, into you, and you bear that wherever you go. Mm -hmm. And because that you are empowered to, to transmit the peace and the presence and the grace of God wherever you go, providing you are aware, awake, and alert to what you have. And it means you to be prayerful and listen to the Spirit and become the Spirit bearer as well. Because you bear life. And that's why Christians are called the salt of the earth. Because we salt preserves life. Remember in the old days they didn't have ice freezers. What do they use? Salt. salt. They use salt to preserve meat and, and food. So it would last. And this is what we do. We become a conduit by which that is realized. Okay, verse 29. Oh my gosh, we're progressing. All things are possible to those who believe. <laughs> Receive him, therefore... <laughs> No, no, 28. 28. Oh, 28? Okay, did I... Uh, okay, why did I do that? Actually, I'm jumping past 20 to 29. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Okay. Now, what does St. Paul mean here? Receive him, therefore, in the Lord. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord. What does that mean? What does this actually mean? Receive him in the Lord. Don't be upset with him. Okay. As Receive them with loves. Oh. As the Lord wants. Okay. Okay. As the Lord wants. With love. Okay. Right? So, okay, now, let's get to, let's get to um, theology. What does the bishop represent? As the start of succession. Yeah. Okay. And when the bishop's present, who does he represent? Christ. Christ. Christ, okay. And so it means to view him as Jesus Christ, representative ambassador. He is the presence of Christ in our midst. Sometimes because our bishops, you know, have their idiosyncrasies and frailties, it's hard to see Jesus. Okay, but he's there. So, therefore, the same respect and honor they accord to the Lord should be shown to who here in this verse? Who are we talking about? Epaphroditus. That was a hard name. Yeah, Epaphroditus. Did I say it right, Captain? Okay. Yeah, and what, what is the driv of that name? What does it mean? Yeah, if you were to go to this original. Yeah, okay. Epaphroditus. Yeah. No, Aphrodite is actually it's Aphrodite. Okay. Because of he was loving, he was that's why he was loving and beauty. He had beauty in his heart. Okay. Him, okay. Okay. Thank you for the insight. We'll, we'll affectionately call him Happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Happy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, <coughs> okay. So, so therefore, the same respect and honor they accord to the Lord should be shown to Aphrodite. Now, are we instructed to do the same with respect to our hierarchs today? David says yes. 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 What do you say? Penny, for your thoughts. Penny, what do you think? Okay. He nods in the affirmative. We do. Plays we it safe. Pray for our clergy. Yeah, we should pray for our clergy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Love the office. Okay. Okay. So, what if they have glaring deficiencies? What do we do then? You respect the cloth. Okay. What? So, yeah. Just his clothes? No, yes. because he wears no. the, the vestments. You huh? respect him. Okay. Without the, the vestments, you put them okay. what you think. Closing prayer. Oops. We'll get into this a little bit deeper. <laughs> the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, as we depart this evening, we do not depart from you. We invite you, we bring you with us. And Lord, we invite you into our homes, especially the house of our heart. And Lord, we invite you to, to be with us, to mingle with our friends, to be with our family, to be with us wherever we go, to touch the lives of the desperate, to touch the lives of the despairing, to touch the lives of those who are poor and need, especially to touch those who are unaware of their needs. Lord, speak through us. Allow us to become the conduit, the messengers, the arms, the legs, the heart that reaches out to those who struggle and hurt. 
We ask all these things in your name, giving thanks, giving to you, glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Great.